Church of Station Hill, it is so good to be with you all today. We're going to begin our time of worship by teaching you a new song. This song comes straight out of Scripture, uh, maybe most notably uh, out of 1 Samuel chapter 17, when David says this to Goliath. He says this, You have come against me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. Today, all the world will know that Israel has a God, and this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle belongs to the Lord. Church of Station Hill, it is not by sword, it is not by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle belongs to the Lord. So whatever battle you're facing this morning, may the Lord find us fighting, not with weapons of flesh and blood, but with a weapon of worship on our knees, hands lifted up in a posture of praise and surrender, remembering that no matter the battle, the battle belongs to the Lord. So my prayer and my hope for us today is that the church at Station Hill would know it, it is not by sword, it is not by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen? We want to teach you new songs that tells us how to do it. So when I fight, so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll see through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Let's all stand up and sing along with us see is the battle you see my victory when all I see is the mountain you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through. Stand against the power of our God You 
saying is like drinking a cool glass of water on a 95 degree day in middle Tennessee right that that the battle is his all we got to do is get on board with him amen that's what it's all about man that's just so good it's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning welcome to the church at Station Hill if you're a guest with us we are honored that you have chosen to come and worship with us this morning. I do want to take just a few moments to point your attention to the screen behind me where you'll see that little QR code. Take your phone out, take a picture of it. We won't worry that you're taking a picture of us. We know you're doing that. Um, or you can text the word e-bulletin to 623-623. That's going to give you our e-bulletin, all sorts of information in there that you'll want to know. Uh, and, and it'll also give you an opportunity to connect with us. There's a little orange button if you scroll down once you get that e-bulletin, well, we'd love to connect with you. So make sure that you do that. That'll give us an opportunity. That'd be awesome. Now, a couple of things I want to highlight in the e-bulletin as well. One is this is our first Sunday for leadership nominations. Okay, so if you're a member of our church, this is where you come in. I want you to I encourage you to, to, to click on that, visit that, and um, nominate leadership in the life of our church. And we'll be doing that for the next several weeks. Another thing that you'll notice in there is Connect Group, and you saw the signs as you were coming in. This is our first Sunday of three where we're going to have Connect, uh, Connect Group give you guys an opportunity to, to learn more about our life groups. You'll hear me say this often. We're a church that not offers groups. We're a church of groups, and we want to encourage every single person in the life of our church to be a part of a life group, a focus study, a Bible reading group, whatever. Group life is very important. So here's the deal. At the conclusion of this service, myself and some other group leaders will be out there in the atrium. We would love to connect with you and answer any questions that you might have about life groups here at the church at Station Hill. Now today, we're kicking off a brand new series, and I'm excited about this because we're focusing in on who God is. And today, we're looking at God is good. And as we prepare our hearts for that, I want us to read out of Psalm 39 together. Read this with me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. You who are his ones, fear the Lord. For those who fear him lack nothing. Let's worship him.
Savior, love. 
Praise the Lord that he holds fast to us even when we don't hold fast to him. Amen. So maybe there was a moment this week, maybe it was even this morning, that the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind right now a moment when you didn't hold fast to your God. And it's only in the, only in the grace of that he's offering you in this moment, only within the context of his grace and his mercy and his kindness, can you have the freedom to bring that, that failing to him? So just take a moment right where you are. What's that moment you didn't hold fast to Christ? Confess that to him, admit that to him. Just take a moment. Jesus, we praise you that in the same breath we confess our unworthiness, we in the next breath can confess our worthiness because of Christ. Not because of what we've, not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done for us on our behalf. What we were incapable of doing, you did for us. So in those moments where we walk away, we wander away, when we don't hold fast to you, Lord Jesus, May the words that we've sung this morning, the truth that we've proclaimed this morning be like an anchor for our souls, calling us back to you again and again and again. We thank you. We praise you. You are good and you have been good to us. And that is enough. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen, church. Be seated. Well, man, what a crazy summer it was. It was awesome. I'm tired now after watching that video. Gosh, remembering some of that. Um, you know what the coolest thing is? I gotta, t- I gotta be honest with you. Um, is is being a dad and being able to go on some of those trips with your kids. Like if you've never done that, um, what a joy! What a joy it is to do ministry alongside your family. That's a big deal here at the church at Station Hill. We're a family equipping church. We're not here to separate you from your kids the second you walk in the door, right? Instead, we want to pair you with your kids for ministry, both in the home and in your community and here at church. And so all the wonderful things that happened over the course of the summer, thank you for praying for those. Uh, We loved seeing the fruit of that for the kingdom, uh, not only uh, in gospel conversations and in people minister to, but really in our own lives, you know, and in the lives of all of of those who participated, uh, no matter what their age, uh, whether you were attending or serving or whatever. It was truly an incredible summer. In the interest of family, though, we decided at some point that we needed to get together regularly as a church, as families, to make sure that we spent time together, we broke bread together, we knew about all the opportunities to, to minister together here at church. And so we have this thing called family gathering. So if you're new to the life of our church, if you hear that term, that's what that is. And every, I don't know, every, uh, every few weeks we try to get together, uh, give you the opportunity to, to hear a little bit about what God's doing in our church and what we're planning, uh, things that you can plug into as a family. Uh, and that's going to be tonight. Okay, so around 5.15, 5.30, just whenever the 4 p.m. service uh, is over. Keep in mind, we, we are, in fact, resuming the 4 p.m. service today. If you know friends, family who, um, who need to hear about that, please let them know about that as well. As soon as that's over, we're going to hop on outside, uh, weather permitting. Uh, we're going to hang out, bring your lawn chairs so you'll have somewhere to sit uh, and a dessert to share if you want to. 
uh, and, uh, and come and hang out and, and let's have a great time fellowshipping together. And then we'll move in here uh, for a brief time of sharing together in this room. Uh, that's how we'll conclude uh, tonight. If for some reason the, the rain is too much or the heat is too much, we're also going to have some tables set up in the atrium for you as well. So uh, no matter what the weather, you guys come on. Let's participate and, uh, and let's, be, let's be a family. All right. Uh, so um, with that in mind, I would love it if we could, uh, together as a church family, ask the Lord to bless uh, not only the fruit that we saw coming out of this summer and all the great things that we did uh, uh, with the Lord uh, and, and to ask him uh, to be in those and to turn those into, um, into fruit for his kingdom. Uh, but let's also bless the, uh, ask the Lord to bless our time tonight uh, as a family uh, and then our offering together in Christ's name. Right. So let's pray real quick. Father. We thank you that you continue to use us to do your work. We thank you that you work in us to will and to act according to your good purpose. And so, Father, we pray that you would just bless at all of our efforts. Uh, our good works are as filthy rags, Lord, but when we are acting out of you and your spirit doing your will, um, then um, even mustard seeds, right, turn into incredible things. And so we pray that. We pray that you would multiply these offerings of not just our treasure today, but also our time and our talent and our testimony. And we ask that in your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Who is God? With one word, he spoke light into darkness full of magnitude and mystery. His gentle hands give the very life we breathe. His heart is good and his love is sure. But can I really open up and trust? Is he close enough for me to touch? Will he hold my secrets near and hear the depth of my cry? Is grace all it takes to redeem what's inside? From the heights of heaven, he saw me still and walked earth that I might know he's real. Oh, what peace he brings and the endless glory I will see. And with that video, we launch into a new eight-week series called God Is. Uh, our media team is doing an incredible job. I feel like what I should have said was a National Geographic Presents, right? Uh, man, they're doing some good work these days. But what a great uh, just video to help us to begin to think about who God is. And we're going to spend the next eight weeks on his character, on his nature, on his ways. Uh, because this is so foundationally important to us as a people. And I know it might seem a little Captain Obvious. We're going to come to church. We're going to talk about the nature and character of God. But as you'll see, it is foundational for everything else. So as you take your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. As we're going to kind of treetop chapter 1, we're going to read verses 26 through 31 in just a few moments. But I want to spend a moment this morning kind of setting up the series uh, for the next eight weeks. Uh, there's a pastor by the name of A.W. Tozer. He was in the Christian and Missionary Alliance tradition, and he wrote a book called The Holiness, or I'm sorry, The Knowledge of God. And so uh, in The Knowledge of the Holy, uh, he had this quote, what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's really true. Foundationally, what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And he goes on in chapter one of that book to say, the history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion and man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he may at any given time say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move towards our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but also of the company of Christians that compose the church. And as I tell you often, we don't go to church, we 
are the church. And so our understanding of who God is, his ways, his character, and his nature is foundational, not only to us as individuals and families, but to who we are as a people. And so A.W. Tozer wrote those words in 1961. So about 60 or 70 years later, how are we doing with our understanding of who God is? Well, a couple of years ago, I ran across some research from Lifeway, partnered with Ligonier Ministries, to do the status of theological education in the United States. And so they uh, surveyed 3,000 self-described evangelicals, people who believe, number one, the Bible is the highest authority, right? It's God's word. And number two, Jesus is the only way to heaven. And here is what they found. I'll read this because I know these are hard to see. The pie chart was the first one, right? And just astounding. 65% of evangelical Christians when surveyed said this, the first and greatest being, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. Uh Uh-oh, I know the word greatest and some of the blogs that were written right probably threw some people off when they took this survey, but Jesus wasn't created. He is God. And almost two thirds of evangelicals, right, got that wrong on this survey. The bar graphs, the Holy Spirit is a force, but not a personal being. 46% of people said that that's true. You know what that means? We're getting our theology more from Star Wars than we are from the Bible. That's what it means. The next one, God will always reward true faith with material blessings in this life. The key word always, 40% of people believe that. Shows you just the depths of the prosperity gospel and how it's gotten into our churches. And this honestly was the most astounding one to me. Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 30% of people said that was true. Like these are evangelical Christians, people who say, I believe the Bible's authority and Jesus is the only way to heaven. 30% of them on this survey said Jesus is not God. So if we're struggling to answer even that question, the reality is, is we've got some work to do to shore up our foundational beliefs in who God is, his character and his nature and his way. Because as Tozer says, the most important thing about us is is that we're rooted in the inspired truth of Scripture about who God is. Not that we create in our minds some image of God, but instead that we hold fast, as we just sang, to the eternal nature and character of who God says that He is. So to do that, let's go all the way back to the fundamentals. Let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Stand with me in honor of God's Word as we read. Genesis 1, verses 26 through 31 this morning. (laughs) And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created the male and female. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. And God also said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you. For all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth... Everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Oh, Lord Jesus, we confess that we've made much too little of you. And so today in this place, through the inspiration of your word, may we properly recalibrate our heads and our hearts and our lives to your greatness and your goodness. And may we look back and see that from the very opening pages of scripture that you have given to us, your people, so that we would know who you are, so that we would know how to live. So open our ears, our hearts, and our lives to you in this place today, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So today the attribute of God that we're going to focus in on is his goodness. 
And so my wife grew up in a church in northern Illinois, in Freeport, Illinois, and at every service I've ever been, her pastor that she grew up with, who's very much a father figure to her and to many others, he says this to the congregation. It's a kind of old-fashioned call and response. He will say, God is good, and the church says, all the time. Some of you know it. And then he'll say, and all the time, and they'll say, God is good. And it's incredible to just watch that and how it shaped and formed that congregation over the years. But as a pastor, I encounter many people who might say that with their lips, but with their hearts because of the circumstances of their lives, because of the brokenness of our world, they begin to question, right? Is God really good? I want you to think about this. In the Garden of Eden, when Satan tempted Adam and Eve, he didn't attack God's existence. What did he attack? God's goodness. The question, did God really say, was his oldest and still his sneakiest strategy to undermine our understanding of the goodness of God. There are a lot of people as a pastor that I encounter, a lot of people that I'm sure you encounter, who have this caricature of God in their mind, right? They know the right answer, God is good, But in their mind, they feel like God is out to get them. So we have to always be sure that we deconstruct the false narratives that we have bought into along the way and we reconstruct truth and we recalibrate our hearts based on what the Bible says. To illustrate this point, I've showed you this before, but it bears repeating. Uh, The Far Side by Gary Larson years ago published a cartoon that I think gets to this point. The, The inscription says, God at his computer. And God is sitting there and he's watching this poor little guy walking down the street and there is a piano precariously dangling above his head by a rope. If you zoom in a little closer, you see that God is getting ready to press the button that says smite. And this is the view that a lot of people hold in their head and in their heart about who God is. He's just waiting to get me, right? He just makes things hard for me. When you look at the circumstances of my life, when you look at what I'm up against, right? God is just waiting to press that button on his computer. Obviously, we understand that we live in a post-Genesis, a post-sinful world. And so because we live in the shadow of that, we've lived in that shadow so long, our hearts become cynical. We begin to develop, even though we won't really admit it, right? These ideas that maybe God isn't really good. Maybe he is out to get me. Maybe he has a different agenda. And it's why we need to go back all the way to Genesis chapter one so that we will remember who God says that he is from the very beginning. And the first thing that he says about himself is this, is that he is the powerful creator, the all powerful creator. From the very beginning, we see that creation is a gift from a loving creator. Now, to be clear, you can't sum up all of the mysteries of the world in one chapter of the Bible. But God inspired Moses to write in beautiful Hebrew poetry, not an exhaustive treatment, but a theologically selective and important treatise to help us understand who God is from the very beginning. And so the Bible appropriately opens with God. We think a lot of times we open the Bible and it's about us. We're in there to be sure. But it's important for us to understand that the Bible begins with all about what God was doing. And so consequently, everything is dependent on him and it's only good when functioning according to his intentions and purpose. And that's important for us to recognize that God had an intent for his creation and it was good. In the very first few words say, in the beginning, God created. And right there, we kind of read the word created and we're like, okay, we get it, right? God made the world. We think about all of the creative things that we do. We live in a town full of creatives, people who do the creative things with music, people who do creative things with art, people who do creative things with relationships. Uh, there's all kinds of creative ways that we see people functioning. But here's the truth. In the Hebrew, this word created is not what mankind does. Matter of fact, in the Hebrew, there's a different word for that kind of creation. That word is asa. That's what we do when we write music, when we write a letter, when we compose something. We are creating from what already exists. But this create is bara. It means God brought something from nothing. Turn to your neighbor and say, bara. See your Hebrew scholars, just like that, right? 
because you've learned a new word today. But you need to read that and understand the distinction of that in our world. It means that literally there was nothing and God spoke it into existence and created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, now the earth was formless and empty. Again, a Hebrew play on words, tohu and bohu. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths and the spirit of God was there hovering over the surface of the waters. And so we know there's great mystery to what was taking place in creation, but we know this. The earth, like the God had created, exists in this kind of desert-like form. That's what those words mean when they're used elsewhere in the Old Testament. But what God did in fashioning and speaking something from nothing, in the artist's freedom and power, he is using his creative activity to draw out his creation and to speaking into six days a land prepared for human habitation. That's what God did in this moment. There's a brilliant and beautiful illustration of this that exists in the academy in Florence, Italy. My wife and I have been there to see it on a fine arts trip in college, and it is Michelangelo's Saint Matthew. And so what happened was Michelangelo was, was uh, hired to, to be able to do this sculpture. He got called away, basically offered more money to go do something else. And so this one was left unfinished. And so what you have here, and this is always amazing to me how artists work, how they can see right in the stone and chisel away anything that doesn't look like that image. Because I don't know about you, but I struggle to create stick men, right? That's the ability artistically that I have when it comes to doing this type of work. I work in words, right? Not in forms, not in sculpture, not in musical notes. But what's amazing is, is you can literally see, can't you, from kind of this, this formless, dull piece of rock, the picture of of Matthew emerging. And that's the word picture that we see here in the early verses of Genesis, that God took the matter that he created and he began to intentionally form it and shape it. And it's amazing to think about the creativity of God, that all God had to do was to speak it. And God said, Isaiah 55, 11 reminds us that God's word is the most powerful thing in all of creation. It brings order, it creates environments, it has unparalleled authority, it accomplishes his purpose, and it makes things good. Jeremiah 16.10 reminds us that we don't serve a God who's an impersonal it, but a personal and he formed all things. So needless to say, it's overwhelming as a pastor to stand here and try to unpack Genesis 1. All week long, I've wrestled with that because of its magnificence and beauty. There are some theologians who have tried to help us grasp just a glimpse of all that's embedded in this first chapter of the Bible. So Gary Brashears of Western Seminary, for example, says that the first chapter alone of Genesis reveals at least 14 truths about God as creator. Take a deep breath. Here we go. He's the one and only God. He exists eternally as the Trinity. He's eternally uncaused. He is living. He is independent. He doesn't need, lack, want anything else or depend on anyone else. He is both transcendently big and he is eminently personal. He is all powerful. He is beautiful. He is holy. He's prophetic. He uses his word to bring forth life. He is gracious and he is the sovereign king. And with that, we're just getting started, aren't we? Because you just step back and you realize all that's here. He goes on to say, in sum, we see that our God is not merely a faceless, intelligent designer of the universe, but the living Lord Yahweh, who alone created everything so that we could live in loving relationship with him now and forever. The other so-called gods, demons really, are created beings that can't create anything. They are imaged by what? Dead idols made of wood and stone, while God is imaged by us, living humans that he created for loving relationship with him now and forever. And so we could go on and on again about all the attributes and characteristics of God that are in this passage, but here's why it matters. Because you, you were made for God. You were made by God. You belong to God. You exist for God. You are restless when you're apart from God. And one day you will return to God. Or what's the alternative way to live? Well, you came from no one. You're alive for nothing. And when you die, you will go nowhere. Those are your two choices. 
Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist philosopher, said this, if you don't believe the Bible, then your only logical option is, and I quote him, the firm foundation of unyielding despair. Because you came from nothing and you're going to nothing. And so we know our hearts long to understand why and what we were created for. Our hearts reach out looking for that. And Genesis 1, from the very beginning, lets us know that our God is the all-powerful creator. And number two, he is the awesome artist. He's the awesome artist. Think about it. There are all kinds of ways that God could have chosen to begin to present himself to us. As a matter of fact, we believe that Moses right, wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, and so it would have made sense for the Bible to start with Exodus because Moses was there for that. He experienced that. That's all about God's redeeming, his saving, his rescuing power, and that would have been a perfect, perfectly acceptable way for God to begin the story of himself, revealing himself to us. But God inspired Moses by the Holy Spirit to go back and get a glimpse of creation to understand that he is what? The divine artist. And that he molded, created, and shaped this world for us, for his children. And I believe that this is reflected in the hearts of our children to this day. I have a lot of files in my office, but do you know what my favorite file is? I have a file full of pictures that our children have drawn for me as a pastor. This happens quite often, two or three times a month. One of our kids will come up to me and they've had a little sketch pad and a book and they're so proud to come up to me in the atrium and they present me this picture. It may have been one of the scenes from this Bible story we were preaching about or talking about. It might be a picture of me behind the pulpit. I knew I needed to lose a little weight, right? When some of those pictures were like, you know, kind of like this, you know, but these kids are just beaming. They are so proud to present what? Their work of art something that they have created. And you know who's even more proud? Their parents who are standing behind them. My kid paid attention in church, right? right? They are super proud of their child. And I keep that file. And from time to time, when I just need to, again, be encouraged about how God works generation to generation, I pull that out and I go through those pictures. Why? Because that's a pure, pure effort of worship. It's a pure act of devotion to say, I created something and I want to give it to you. I know that there are famous artworks worth supposedly millions and millions of dollars. You know it's worth more than that to me? The artwork that my kids have created for me over the years. Because it's an offering. It's something they give to us as parents. It's something they give to us. And it reflects the heart of the creator. And in the same way, I believe that we instinctively understand that as children. It's sad that that gets beat out of us over life as we go. That we lose that ability and that wonder and that joy of creation. Because I believe it reflects the heart of the greatest artist, which is God. And it's why the church should lead the way in our works of art, in our singing, in our songwriting, in all of the things that we do creatively because when we do it, we are reflecting the heart of the creator. There are pattern after pattern layered on top of each other in Genesis chapter one. Our physicists and scientists are only beginning to understand just how deep all of this runs in creation, how well calibrated the design of God is in his creation. And so we love patterns. If we sit in the sand, right, we sketch out little patterns. We look for patterns in the stars above us at night in our sketchbooks and our notebooks. Some of you are probably doing it right now, right? You're drawing out little patterns. Our minds are drawn to them. That's because from the very beginning, God established his creation according to a pattern. There was an announcement, God said, there was a commandment from God, let there be, and then there was separation as God, just like that sculpture, right, began to emerge his creation into what he wanted it to be. It's in stereo, which is pretty cool to me. It's called Hebrew parallelism that's there. So the day one, right, we see that God separates the light from the dark, and on day four, we get the sun and the moon. Day two, we have the water separated above and below the firmament. And day five, we get the birds of the sky and the fish that swim in the seas. On day three, we see the earth is separated from the seas and vegetation emerges. And then on day six, animals and man are there to dwell on that land. And then we get a report. It was so, and the evaluation, God saw that it was what, church? Good. It's all around us. 
the patterns by which he reveals himself that continue as a thread throughout all 66 books of the Bible are established right here in Genesis chapter 1. And here's the cool thing. You and I, as we read at the end of chapter 1, are not called to just be spectators, but we get to be participants in God's plan. If we jumped ahead a chapter to Genesis chapter 2, God gave Adam a job. Anybody remember what it was? It was a gardener. He got to be the steward of the Garden of Eden. Now think about this for a minute. Garden of Eden, you can't imagine a more wonderful place in your mind. Did God really need Adam to like trim the rose bushes and to make sure everything was watered and to flip on the lights so that the sun would come up in the morning? Did God need Adam? No, but by his gracious initiative, he wanted Adam to have dignity and purpose. He wanted to give Adam a reason to glorify him. He wanted to give Adam a means, a way by which he would do something that God was already doing, that he got to join him in his purpose. How beautiful is that, that God allows us to participate with him in taking what he has created in the universe and shaping it into art, shaping it into buildings, shaping it into all kinds of things. Because when we do that kind of work, we are, reflect, we are reflecting the awesome work of our artist. Right here, Moses, it's clear, wants us to constantly lift up our minds to see the creative power from God. And this includes our third point this morning, the father of mankind, that God is the father of mankind. At the pinnacle of his creation is man. And then God said, verse 26, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. If that's ever caught you off guard, it should. Because God said, let us. I ran across a great phrase in the commentary this week. It called that the magisterial plural. What does it mean? It means, of course, that God exists as the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so God said, let us make man in our image in order to glorify and honor him. And you get three creates. God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. So we see the foundation for our worth that we are created by God, every single human being from the preborn all the way to the time that God calls us home. We are of value and worth because we are created in his image. And yet we see the unique distinctions that God put male and female complementing one another so that his plan and his purpose, his creative purposes would continue from generation to generation. God weaves all this together and more. And so one of the things that we need to lean into is this idea of what it means to be created in God's image. We've lost sight of that in our culture, even within our churches. We need to remember that we have a unique and special place as God's created beings, that human beings alone are God's image bearers. Animals are not. And think about this, even angels are not listed. Instead, it's human beings. We have a unique role and responsibility to bear the image of God. And if you think about it as God's image bearers, almost all of our problems come when we either overinflate ourselves or we deflate, we underestimate ourselves and our positioning in God's creation. So let's think about where we're at. You have God, who's the all-powerful creator. We are not God. Instead, we are under the authority of God. And yet, this passage makes it clear that God did what? He put us over what you might call lower creation. So what are our temptations? Well, we're pulled in one of those two ways. We want to have God-like control over our lives, and we get ourselves in trouble when we try to be God. Adam and Eve, that was the original sin. They weren't content to continue to be in relationship with God. Instead, they wanted to be gods. And we have a world with technology and all of our so-called power and influence in which we think we can set ourselves up as gods and we run into trouble. On the other end of the spectrum, there are those out there, especially those who lean into a naturalistic worldview, who would claim we're just animals along with the rest of the animal kingdom. And when we begin to think like animals, hold ourselves to those kinds of accountability and standards, right? That's when we lower ourselves. And we have a whole host of problems that comes from that as well. When we think, ah, we're just part of the animal kingdom like everything else. You see, even these few words help us to calibrate us, to understand that God has given us dominion over. And that doesn't mean that we exploit and abuse his creation. 
But instead, just like Adam was placed in the garden as a steward, you and I have a responsibility to steward that which God has entrusted to us. No, we're not God. We don't own it. It's his. But we have a responsibility before him to take what he's entrusted to us and to use it wisely and well. Why? Well, we want to mirror God as our act of worship because we are God's representatives in the world. Again, a thread that runs throughout the Bible is this understanding of us as representatives of God. And so there are a couple of things we need to remember. Number one, this is the root of the truth that in God's image bearer, all human beings, all human beings have particular value, dignity, and worth. Let me say that another way. You and I do not have permission to call not good what God has called good. And we need to remind the world around us about that. That yes, because of the fall, the image of God has been distorted. It's been warped, but it's still present. And we need to see that and we need to call that out in the lives of our family members and friends and neighbors. The second thing that it tells us is this. We know that in the ancient world, it was only the emperors and the pharaohs who were held to be as divine image bearers. And so what Genesis is telling us is that we are all children of the king. We're all royalty, right, in that sense, and that we were created to bear God's image and to represent him to the world around us. Just like those ancient kings would go around the kingdom and set up statues of themselves to remind the people of that community who was in charge. In the same way, we are supposed to be that kind of ambassador for God in our neighborhood, in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, that we are the image bearers of God. We are his agents of grace and truth in a world that is broken. It's beautiful. And this idea, you might want to write these things down as well. There's kind of a threefold first commission that God gives to Adam and Eve. Number one is this, we get to enjoy God's grace. Think about that for a minute. Again, the pinnacle of all of this, this powerful creation is us that we have the opportunity as human beings to enjoy the lavish, common, and abundant grace that God has given us as his people. And so we should enjoy that fully. Second thing here, right? We were designed to enjoy God's grace so we could do what? Fill the earth and subdue it so that we could extend his glory, so that we could be those image bearers as we join him in creating, again, not the way that God creates out of nothing, but creating out of what he's given us to create from. We're able to enjoy his grace, extend his glory. Why? Here's our purpose, so that God is exalted. Because the way that you and I live out these truths, a watching world is gonna look at us and they're gonna know if we have a high view of God or if we have a low view of God. They're gonna watch the way we embrace the world around us, the way we appreciate God's creative acts, the way that we partner with him in advancing his grace and his glory in the world, and they're going to see what we really believe, just as Tozer said. And so I love this idea that right there from the very first chapter of Genesis, we see that the story is about God, but we see our responsibility, enjoy his grace, extend his glory so that he is exalted. At the end of all of this, in verse 31, church, God saw all that he had made and it was good? No, it was very good. There is a crescendo that leads to the end of this chapter that reminds us that it's very good. So how do we embrace this? How do we push back against the lie that God's not really good, that he's really out to get me? Well, there are several ways to do that. Let me give you three this morning. The first one is this, delight in God's creation. Delight in God's creation. We know that the world and its beauty, theologians will tell us, again, is the way that God presented himself from the beginning. It was the first sign of his greatness. But do you know what we do? We put our face in front of a computer screen. We consume, right, hours and hours of cultivated, curated content that keeps us locked in to a worldview that's not nearly as big and rich and as beautiful as what God has given us. Turn off the screen, go outside, spend some time delighting in God's creative power from the smallest thing, right, to the greatest sunset, the creation in the universe. We can be in awe of God and what he's done. Uh, James Bryan Smith wrote this in The Good and Beautiful God. He said, creation speaks of the goodness and glory of God through dazzling colors and intoxicating scents. 
When I read that, I was reminded of our second daughter, Lexi. She is one of those visceral learners. She loves to learn through all of her senses. And when we used to go to Cracker Barrel, she used to smell all 500 Yankee candles in Cracker Barrel. Like we couldn't get in and out of that place until she had smelled them all. Why? Because God created every one of those scents. God created so many things for us to appreciate and enjoy. He says this, the sunrise and sunsets are grand spectacles that happen twice each day, but that are seldom noticed by people too busy to look. Isn't that an indictment on us? That when we're overwhelmed with our problems, when we're stuck in our fears, all we gotta do is get up or take a few moments at dinner time to step outside and watch the colors, watch what God has created and be like, yep, God's got this, right? I'm back to where I need to be. So incredible to think about. He says, God could have made an ugly world. He was not obligated to make a world that inspires all, but yet he did. He left his fingerprints everywhere for you and I. So let's delight in God's creation, noting that God called it good. The second handle for us today is this, dwell on the greatness of God's character. Dwell on the greatness of God's character. Further developing in the Bible this understanding of the goodness of God, we recognize that all ancient religions were built on this false premise. If you do well, you will be blessed. If you sin, you will be punished. But Jesus boldly proclaimed in Matthew 19, 17, there is only one who is good. In all of his stories and teachings, Jesus describes a God who seems altogether good and always out for our good, even if we can't always understand it. It's why in our minds and hearts we veer towards this false image of God, a God who's keeping some kind of divine scorecard. I've realized as a pastor, you realize why we do that, right? Because in a world of chaos, we want to be in control of God. So if I think that's the way the rules go, well, God, I'm going to do these things, then you are obligated to me. Or God, if somebody does what they're not supposed to do, well, press the smite button, God, and smite the mighty smiter, right? That's the way that we like to operate. But you can't do that. You can't put God in your box. You have to dwell on the greatness of his character. And that character, Jesus tells us, is he is the only one who is truly good. Again, we can't always see it. We can't always perceive it. It's why this third handle is important, is that we have to develop trust in the goodness of God's care. As we move throughout scriptures, we see, as I told you earlier, good in Genesis 1 is defined as something functioning the way God intended As more and more of the gospel story is revealed throughout the pages of scripture, we begin to realize that God understands that things are broken. So he sent his son so that we could reclaim what true goodness is, his plan and purpose, and that's what? To be restored to him. And so God will use whatever it takes to bring us to him, even if it's unpleasant, even if we can't understand it at the time, because the greatest good is us being rightly reconciled to our creator. And following that through line, we get all the way to the Apostle Paul. We looked at this verse, but I want to look at it again because it's so famous and so important. Romans 8, 28, which says this. For we know that all things work together for what? The good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So as I told you a few weeks ago, don't pluck that out of context. Don't come up short. Recite that entire verse. This isn't just some easy bumper sticker that we slap onto something, but it's important that we understand what good is because the definition of good is that which makes us more like Jesus. And so all things God can weave together to make us look more like Jesus for those of us who are called according to his purpose. And so we could go on and on but I think it's true. We can truly push out the falsehood that says, "Mm, I'm not sure that God is good. And we can boldly declare by looking at Genesis and the through line of God's goodness in scripture that God is good and all the time. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you that from the very opening of creation, we are in awe of your greatness and your goodness. Lord, we confess that we easily forget those things. 
And so this morning in this place, would you remind us of the gospel that you created and it was good. It was very good. Your plan was to create, create us for a relationship with you. But we know that mankind sinned. We know that Adam and Eve attempted to try to be gods instead of being content to be in relationship with you. So now we all live in the dark shadow of Genesis chapter three. But into that shadow step your son. Into the brokenness of our world came Christ, who showed us what true goodness looks like, who revealed to us that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still in the shadow of darkness, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to redeem us so that we could know your goodness, a relationship with you once again. And so Lord Jesus, our response today is this, to kill the lie in our hearts once and forever, that God isn't great and that he isn't good. To embrace the truth that God is indeed great and good from creation to the cross, from Genesis to Revelation, from Alpha and Omega. Our God is great and good and we need him. So we come running to him today. And it's in his name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Stand with us as we sing this song in response. through his son, Jesus Christ. Today, if you need to know that, if you've ever doubted that, we would love to show you in God's word how you can know that truth and apply it to your heart and your life personally. It's why we're here, myself and our team, will be by the Next Steps banners as soon as we are dismissed. If you're at home watching online, simply text the word CONNECT to 623-623 and one of our team members will follow with you as soon as possible. If you're a guest with us today, we're honored and delighted you're here. We've got some good news. We've got lunch ready for you. Uh, and so we have welcome reception today. As soon as the service is over, join us across the atrium and up the stairs. Learn a little bit more about the life of our church. No obligation, just a chance to meet staff, hear our story, and hear about what next steps might be for you if you feel like this is the place that God's calling you to make your church home. But church family, I pray that you're in awe as I was this week as I studied Genesis 1 of the greatness and goodness of our God. So today, let's go knowing 
that you are loved and you are sent. Let's sing the doxology as we close. Sing it again. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here grace and peace to love and serve the Lord. You're dismissed.